The 60s will be described as a decade in which football became the number one sport in America. Professional football was America's first and best reality show, you know? It had everything, spectacle, fabulous athleticism, violence. Eventually, it moved into another orbit beyond anything anybody would have ever thought. Hi there, football fans. It's National Pro Highlights time again. And look at that snow. Hmm. Join me for a trip around the circuit for all the big National Football League games on the The most exciting new development on the American sports scene came to life in 1960 hmm. with the birth of the American Football League. What's more, you gotta get it done. The AFL's long journey to respectability mirrored America's race to the moon. Both were within reach by the end of a tumultuous decade. We find ourselves rich in goods, but ragged in spirit, reaching with magnificent precision for the moon but falling into raucous discord on Earth. That was a year in which everything had gone wrong. The Tet Offensive in Vietnam, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, Martin Luther King was assassinated, the first campus riots broke out at Columbia. Everything just seemed to be coming apart at the seams. And the one thing that was going right was the space program. Four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. The whole country was fixed on it. Okay, we have our differences, but this, we're in together. Here's something everybody can pull for. We're on the way to the moon. On July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 achieved the goal set by President Kennedy at the beginning of the decade. That's one small step for man. There was no doubt we can do whatever we set our minds to doing was the, was the dominant mindset at the time. Six months earlier, the New York Jets delivered a more earthbound feat, but no less earth-shattering. A historic victory in Super Bowl III. That ball is caught, but this game is over. The New York Jets are the world champions in a stunning upset. They have beaten the Colts handily here today. The Jets beating the Colts in the Super Bowl was more shocking than a man walking on the moon. Uh, I feel like the man walking on the moon, they prepared us for that, okay? Space launches through the 60s, got you ready for that. No one was prepared for the Jets to beat the Colts. It was unthinkable. Colts, did you expect anything like this? You know, New York is used to winners, aren't they? Well, uh, yes, they have been in the past, all the great teams they've had here, and we're just very happy that we were the teams that brought the great uh, team here, the Jets, to the fine fans we have. Could you do it again tomorrow? Well, we think so. Yet the AFL's decade-long search for respect did not end with the Super Bowl. The storyline coming out of Super Bowl III was it was a fluke. A lot of the Colts players said, if we play 10 times, we're going to win nine of those games. In the eyes of the NFL establishment, the AFL was still junior league, separate, not equal. That's why, with the league speeding toward a 1970 merger, the issue over realignment threatened to tear it all apart. You know, it was like the final stages of an arranged marriage, if you will, and uh, there was a lot of uneasiness. Perhaps one of the most difficult things was for the National Football League to determine what franchises would now join the new American Football Conference to even out the two conferences. Nobody in the NFL wanted to go join the AFL. You had 16 teams in one league 
and 10 in the other. You know, it would be sacrilege if the Chicago Bears or the Green Bay Packers or the Los Angeles Rams went. But then Roselle said, you know, we're going to give $3 million to each team that goes. And Carol Rosenblum for the Baltimore Colts, I'll go, you know. So the Colts went first. The next two volunteers were harder to come by. Commissioner Pete Roselle literally sent the owners to the mattresses, forcing a marathon 36-hour meeting which had many sleeping at the league office. Finally, two teams were convinced to move. The rivals Steelers and Browns would join the AFC in a division that featured Paul Brown's Cincinnati Bengals. Well, one of the reasons we came back into football and here in Cincinnati with an American League football team is that we knew that by 1970, by constitution, there will be just one league, the National League, and it must be a realigned. And uh, the first thing that is stated there is by geography. And of course, that puts us in the position we want. Paul Brown bought a team in the AFL knowing that there was going to be a merger. He even made the statement, I didn't pay $10 million to be in the AFL. They will take their world of color and excitement into the new Riverfront Stadium, where they will meet a new opponent, the Cleveland Browns, in what should become one of the game's great rivalries. I think that you could look and see that division with the Steelers, the Browns, and the former Browns owner, Paul Brown, in Cincinnati, as a logical and heated rivalry. So I think it made for good football sense. It was left to the Steelers' Dan Rooney to convince the AFL owners of its logic, especially Al Davis, an AFL pioneer and its former commissioner. I said, okay, we're here. You know, I didn't act like I was thrilled. I said, we're here. And I said, this is the division we're going to be in. And Davis immediately, as Davis does, he said, that's not your division. I said, what do you mean it's not our division? He says, we got to sit down and decide what the division is. We've got to debate that. And Vince Lombardi grabbed him and threw him up against the wall. I said, listen, if that isn't the division, we're at that door right now. Davis was all right. He, 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 he got to be OK. Realignment left resentment on both sides. There was also a sense that it cost the AFL its identity. I wanted the American Football League to stand on its own, to be the finest league in all of professional sports. The newspapers were filled with comments about you know, how people felt, how the fans felt. There were campaigns, remember the AFL bumper stickers came out of Buffalo. I felt that the, that the leagues could have merged and formed Major League Football, made up of the National Football League and the American Football League. Baseball has done that for 100 years. I would have just put every expansion team in the AFL. That would have done my heart good. We, we would, ha would have had all the expansion teams that could have been looked down on and denigrated, and then every, at the end of every year, beat the NFL in the Super Bowl. It was clear one Super Bowl win would not be enough, but one player emerged from its glow as football's biggest star. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Namath. After we won the Super Bowl, people climbed on the car and they climbed on the hood just to see Joe Namath, to wave to him, to touch him. The young girls are screaming at him. And a police officer said to me, said, I haven't seen anything like this since the Beatles. When the Jets landed in Buffalo, at the Buffalo airport, before the first game of the 69th season, there were several hundred Bills fans to greet the Jets. The Jets were our team. And it's not just Buffalo fans, they all felt that way. Players from other teams felt that way. Opponents treated Namath like a conquering hero. He was the focus of female fans and opposing game plans. The big thing this week is going to get, get, get to Joe, just like every other week. Got to get to the quarterback. You can't give that guy enough credit, though, you know, playing with two bad knees. and He's the best in the business. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, what are we going to do? You, you, you still want to go on the theme of Namath? He was the league. I mean, he became the guy. I mean, he was the poster of the American Football League. He was on billboards and magazine covers, in print ads and pantyhose. Joe Namath in Beauty Mist Pantyhose? Yes, we did it to prove that Beauty Mist can make any legs look like a million dollars. Now, I don't wear pantyhose, but if beauty mess can make my legs look good, imagine what they'll do for yours. <laughs> can you tell me some of the other projects specifically that you might be involved in? 
Well, other than the companies uh, that I work with full time, like Fabergé, or Brut, and uh, Kelvin Clothes, and, and Franklin Sporting Goods, and, and Aero Shirts, and Hamilton <laughs> Beach Popcorn Poppers, and Lazy Boy Chairs, and Dynamic Classics Luggage, other than those jobs, uh, my time is, is my own. You have to keep in mind that this guy was a fabulous football player. Long before he put on the pantyhose, he was taking a terrible beating, and yet he always kept coming back. People respected Namath, but they also knew he had this uh, raffish theatrical side to him, and he got away with things. Yes, they go double-double. He's still running across. He's yeah, not going to try. I like it in there because the middle's open on double-double. It's pretty good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, flank left, 63 seam on one. Ready? Joe Namath was pretty cool. I mean, I didn't mind the hair. I didn't mind the pant. I thought the pantyhose was funny. Uh, I didn't mind him at all. The only bad thing was, you know, he was in the wrong league. For years, Namath and the Jets played in the shadow of their crosstown rivals until they met in the preseason, seven months after the Super Bowl. Now, this was no regular exhibition game. We had two guys that were going to retire, Bill Mathis and Larry Grantham, that came back just to play in that game. It's one ball game that I would not have missed for my life. It was as important to me as the Super Bowl was, because even though we were the world champions in professional football, in New York for several years, people perceived the New York Jets like it's a minor league. Whip him, whip him now, let's whip him. They own, own Manhattan. And, and we had to change that. We played them at the Ale Bowl in front of like 85,000 people, and we just killed them. Mike Battle, a rookie, had that famous punt return where he hurtled over the Giants' punter. And Namath had one of the most brilliant passing days ever. I think he completed something like 16 out of 18 through three touchdown passes. So we won in a big way, and it eventually cost Ali Sherman his job. The Jets took Manhattan. Namath was king of New York, but he ran afoul of the NFL's king of New York that summer. The allegations were that patrons of the nightclub owned by Namath had ties to organized crime. It is responsibility of this office to advise individuals, both players and other club personnel, whenever any of their associations could possibly cause harm to their individual reputations or the game of professional football. This office became aware of the backgrounds and habits of certain persons frequenting Bachelors Three, of which Joe Namath is a co-owner. Joe, we have uh, reliable information that undesirable individuals are frequenting your restaurant. And we're asking you, demanding, we want you to sell in 24 hours your interest in the restaurant. I asked him if it made any difference that I didn't have anything to do with anything going wrong. He said, no, it doesn't. He has to do his job, and uh, if I didn't sell, I would be suspended. Well, I, I'm not selling. I'll quit. This is ridiculous. I felt like I was getting persecuted for something here that wasn't right, man. And uh, I refused to go along with it. We couldn't believe what was going on. You know, we didn't know he was going to come back or not come back. Uh, luckily, at the time, uh, he was dating my babysitter, so... <laughs> which is another story, which I won't even go into that one. But uh, she was beautiful, and I found out from her that he really wanted to, you know, come and uh, unretire. But, uh, but we really thought that we had lost him. The tears were real, but the retirement was short-lived. Namath sold his share of the bar and became the bridge to the new NFL. A year later, Broadway Joe would lead pro football into prime time. You want to go to a bar? Are you paying? Are you talking? It's in the player's code. Well, talk to me in code. <laughs> code, will you? Pete Rosell sitting right there. Oh, 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 hi, Pete. <laughs> 
Joe Namath wasn't the only AFL star with a face for TV. O.J. Simpson got a head start in showbiz at USC. O.J. Yeah. Well, that's what I don't judge for the defense. Uh, loss in space. Star How'd Trek. You, how'd you do? Good. Academy Award. <laughs> Emmy. <laughs> well, certainly uh, O.J. Came, uh, came out of college with enormous charisma. This was the Heisman Trophy winner. He comes out of the West. Legs flashing, hips snaking, the fast gun. While it wasn't apparent that he was going to become the Hertz commercial or his Hollywood career, it was apparent that this guy was a very special football player. Well, there was a lot of buzz. The juice with that tremendous speed, strong in his shoulders. Go! Brought up under the USC kind of thing right there in Hollywood. Slow up. You know, that guy is pretty well trained on how to promote themselves. Hey, put that on film. <laughs> Look at it. He was also white friendly, a kind of accessible black figure that Jim Brown, for example, never was. Nothing to it, Jack. <laughs> O.J. didn't bring that edge. At the same time, he brought this enormous talent. Like, a, like an instrument, got to tune it just right, a little at a time. The biggest dichotomy about O.J. is if he lost himself that night and did what he was found not guilty of, but everyone assumes he did, the most puzzling part of it is you can talk to a lot of people who know O.J. They'll tell you some things. One, captain of every team he ever played on. Never lost his temper. Never argued with an official. Was team leader everywhere he went. If you played on the Bills and you had a personal problem, you went to O.J. The two OJs. The first choice in the first round, Buffalo. Buffalo is expected to make their choice in less than the 15 minutes. Up until the time I entered junior college, I was a 49er fan. I'm still am as far as just sentimental reasons, you know, because it's my hometown. But there's a few other teams I like a little better. Who do you like? I like the Rams quite a bit. Uh, I like the Jets. I like Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have to like Buffalo. Nobody can tell ya. There's only one song worth singing. They may try and sell ya. Cause it hangs them up to see someone like you. But you've got to. O.J. Simpson, I, that was my last year, and I'd like to say that he's the reason I retired <laughs> because I remember he got the ball and he kind of made one step at me, which froze me a little bit, and then he backtracked, and he went all the way around for about a 30, 40-yard game. The speed was phenomenal, and uh, the moves were great. He was something. O.J. Simpson, whose only credo was guile and grace and grab a bunch of yards. O.J.'s rookie year was the AFL's last. A glimpse of an icon who became the first player in NFL history to rush for 2,000 yards in a season. Nobody could run the football like O.J. I mean, I still think in his prime, he was probably the best running back that ever played in the NFL. His celebrity has gone different directions since, for sure. In 1969, some 400,000 of the nation's youth traveled to a farm in upstate New York for the biggest pop culture festival in history. A celebration of peace and music and long hair. You wanted freedom, honest expression, freedom to uh, live and be the way you felt. You weren't really breaking a lot of rules or any rules, but people thought you were breaking rules by just simply the way you look. Through Namath, the AFL had come to represent certain aspects of the counterculture. But overall, the players from the rival leagues were not that different. 
First of all, we came out of the same kind of colleges that the other guys did. And generally, we're highly disciplined, respectful of authority, in a way that's almost incomprehensible today. If you were in high school in the 50s, you remember that many of your coaches were guys who were Marines and Naval officers during the Second World War. These guys had a military discipline to them. There was no uh, flakiness permitted. Was Weeb not the ultimate crew-cut guy? I mean, he was. And what about Hank Stram? Come on, come on, do something back there! Did you see that? Well, shit. Even the AFL's most colorful coach had strict rules regarding hair and dress. 1969, at the height of Woodstock and the age of Aquarius, the first day of training camp, Hank Stram's talking to the team and just says, these are the rules. No sideburns, no facial hair, no mustaches, no hair longer than my own. The word around here is discipline, and there's only one way to teach it. You'll be up at 6.30, you'll be eating by 7. If you miss a meal, it won't come out of your hide, but it will come out of your paycheck. He had a dress code, and you had to have shirt and tie, and you had to wear the black jacket as well as houndstooth slacks. Because I told him to. Hank's father was in the clothing business, so dressing and looking sharp were always you know, a big thing to Hank. Yeah, I mean, his team not only played well, but they looked better coming off the bus or walking through a hotel lobby than any team in pro football history. We were in Boston. Abner Haynes was in the lobby, and the lady comes up and hands, hands him his, her bag, wanted him to take it up to the room. <laughs> Thought he was a bellhop. Uh, he did. He made a couple bucks on the deal, which wasn't too bad at that time. But that was the dress code, and uh, he was strict with that. The same rules applied at home to Team Strand. We sold family with our football team. I know initially they laughed about the uniforms and they laughed about the facial hair thing and all the things that we did, but I think they knew that it wasn't anything phony, that it was just a philosophy. Stram wanted uniformity of purpose, not just uniformity. In fact, it was the Chiefs' progressive attitude toward race that helped them become a championship contender. I think it's very important for us to uh, bring everybody into training camp with a very open mind, and this is exactly what we do. We don't particularly care where the boy is from, what color he is, what nationality, what anything. We're only concerned about helping our football team win football games, and whoever can best do this will be a member of our squad. When we fielded our starting team my second year with the Chiefs, and I started at outside linebacker, I was one of three white guys that played, and we started with eight blacks. You got to remember the times. That was not the norm by any stretch. But I think Hank Stram, to his undying credit, looked at, at the great minds of, of great football talent that was in a lot of these black schools, especially in the South, and came out with some absolutely tremendous football players. Bobby Bell, one of the great outside linebackers ever. Buck Buchanan from Grambling, 285 pounds. Jim Marsalis, Emma Thomas, Otis Taylor. These were some of the greatest players in AFL history. Dawson throws a wobbler intended for Taylor, and Otis makes a remarkable catch. Great grab by Taylor. Signing Otis Taylor was a coup for the Chiefs, but they wrote history when they made Willie Lanier the first black middle linebacker in pro football. Middle linebacker, the quarterback on defense, you know, it was, you know, part of this nonsense that black players didn't have the intellectual and leadership skills to do this. Willie Lanier absolutely exploded that. On the double zone, how you want to pound it offset on uh, the double zone? You can move over. I'll move over. You take first, man. Take. Yeah, well, I got that wing back. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. When the 60s started, the Washington Redskins still were trying to sign their first black player to go from that to a team that was led by black people. That was monumental uh, and unprecedented. The comradeship, uh, the black white relationships that we have are, are 
I don't think parallel in, in, in any team, and I, I'm just elated with it. And, and these kind of things build champions and, and keep you champions, and I feel real good about the Chiefs' future. The AFL was a league of opportunity and also a league of innovation. We had people who developed so many new things to the game. It was really a league that was almost a proving grounds for new ideas. Men in motion, shifting complex formations, those things were not common in the National Football League at the time. In an age when most football coaches are still imitating Vince Lombardi's fundamental approach to the game, Hank Stram, the coach of the Kansas City Chiefs, stands apart as an original thinker. We used the zone defense at that particular time when not many people were using it in professional football. We used the moving pocket when everybody laughed at it because they thought, well, you've got to be a pocket passer to be in pro football. That's a college vehicle of getting the ball down the field. Our philosophy, move in the pocket. Make sure you one, one time you roll right, you roll left. This strategy allowed quarterback Lynn Dawson more time to throw the ball and limited the enemy's pass rush. Many believe that Kansas City offense is the offense of the future in professional football. Our tie-dye formation was a formation whereby we kept the quarterback, tight end, fullback, and tailback all in a row. And then we would shift. And nobody moved until they saw where the tight end went. We were trying to create a moment of indecision. Brown right slot, Leonard. Brown right slot. 51 full pop geo, huh? Hank Stram recognized something that is conventional wisdom today, which is anything the offense can do that causes the defense to have to think before it reacts is to the offense's advantage. That's the way, Leonard. Well, keep giving him a different look. He was always looking at things, new ideas, new schemes. The restaurateurs in the Kansas City area, as soon as he would come in, would run over with, with uh, paper napkins to put down instead of the cloth ones that he would use because they were more expensive, because he would just get to doodling. Football was his life. Stram's other innovations included freeform calisthenics, impossibly short shorts, and language. Ah, oh, you pooped it up there, jeez. You want to poop it through there from here, and then you want to poop poop from out the next one. There, there are certain words that I am attracted to, you know, I don't know why, like I use the word smush. That linebacker's playing soft on the outside. We ought to uh, smush it in there in pretty good shape. Well, where it came from, I don't know, but it's a wor juicy word. Blue right slot, motion left, 61 toss, man with a smush. Blue left slot, 53 pass. With a smush. The what? Smush. However strange, it worked. The 69 Chiefs were the most entertaining team in all of football. Bobby Holmes, the 20, makes the catch. He's at the 15, still on his feet. At the 10, still on his feet. He's cutting right over the five. Bobby turns four. They called it Hank Stram's Wild West Variety Show, a carnival in full color that fit the wide open style of the AFL. In today's NFL, the West Coast offense is as common as helmets and shoulder pads. Attack horizontally, use the whole field, a short pass is as good as a run. Cuts in the field, 10-5, touchdown, Buffalo! You know, you see that every week. Our football team as well. You know, every team in the league is, is running some version of the West Coast offense. It was an offense showcased in Super Bowl 23 by Bill Walsh and Sam Weish. Back to throw, Montana. Stepped up, throws. But its roots are in the AFL. In the late 60s, Walsh helped design the system as an assistant under Paul Brown. Sam Weish was one of his quarterbacks. Alternating at quarterback were number 14, Sam Weish, a free agent who functioned like another coach. 
The team, of course, was the Cincinnati Bengals, who became the AFL's final franchise in 1968. A brochure was prepared pointing out the features of the city and why it was the logical selection for the franchise. All aspects of the area were shown in this brochure, which was excellent. For 17 years, Paul Brown ruled pro football. The only coach ever to have a team bear his name, he built the Cleveland Browns into a football dynasty. And for his contributions to the game, was inducted into Pro Football's Hall of Fame. To me, that's the father of professional football. Everything that Paul Brown did in the early 60s with the Cleveland Browns, and certainly in the late 60s and 70s with the Bengals, 95% of that is what we do today. From scouting players, to breaking down film, to game planning, to on the field teaching, coaching drills, and so forth. 50 years later, everybody's still basically doing the same thing. I'm quite familiar with Paul Brown, the coach of the Cincinnati Bengals. I played for him for two years with the Cleveland Browns. He has never been a razzle-dazzle coach because when I was there, he had Jimmy Brown, and he just gave the ball to Jimmy Brown, but I don't believe that they have a Jimmy Brown in Cincinnati this year. Ironically, the deficiencies of the expansion Bengals led to the innovation of the West Coast offense. You've got a, you've got a real problem on this. If this man gets any surge back here, the quarterback takes one step back, Harry Gunner with his nine-foot arms. They never had the greatest offensive line of all time, so they had to try to find a way to run the ball without running it. You know, I mean, so it's shorter passing game. They had a quarterback, Virgil Carter, and I don't think he had the strongest arm of all time. So it was more out of necessity that they came up with this. The West Coast offense was born in Cincinnati. Walsh used to tell us, I want the defense to defend every play on every part of the field. Like shallow crosses, get players running across the defense. The fullback swing pass. Roll right, fullback flat. Roll right, fullback flat. Good. And Walsh didn't care if it went for two yards. You made them defend the field way out there. And it bought us as receivers a little more room, a little more space. And we took advantage of that a lot. Two years ago, Trumpy was working as a bill collector in Los Angeles. Today, he's an all pro. The most famous play that the 49ers ever ran on it is that the catch is a is a play that we had that Paul Brown put in. Give him credit for it. Q8 option is called. We're going to call a sprint option. He's going to break up and break into the corner. Okay, you got it. Quarterback has the option to run and throw. We used it a lot. Bill Walsh loved that play, and that was the genesis of the West Coast offense. He throws into the end zone. Touchdown! Touchdown! Holy smoke, Bill. We keep trying that same darn thing, and we keep getting knocked in our pride every time. At times, Brown bristled at the experiments conducted by the young genius, but the West Coast offense was a success. The Bengals, from the get-go, they were a team to be reckoned with. In their first home game of the season, the Bengals attacked the Broncos like so much fresh meat on the hook. The Bengals had tasted blood, and they liked it. They were the only team in 1969 to beat both the Chiefs and the Raiders who played in the championship game. In 1969, as in the two years prior, the Chiefs and Raiders were the best teams in the West. It was a natural rivalry. You had the Kansas City Chiefs, a dapper outfit. They were a team that projected the image that Hank Stram wanted to project. And it was a far different image than the image of Al Davis and later John Madden and the Oakland Raiders. This intimidating, swashbuckling bunch. Come on, Ben, hit him anyway! Come on, Ben, let's go! So that rivalry, in many ways, the defining rivalry of the 10 years of the AFL, came out of those terrific contrasts. A lot of players didn't like each other. I mean, let's get right down to it. You know, that was, that, that was back in the days when you could really, I mean, God, you can blast people out there. They just clothesline you. They hit you out of bounds. They do all that kind of stuff. He is dead. Did he get creamed by Aaron Brown? It's too bad the game's not like that anymore. 
Len Dawson seemed to get the worst of it. There's an incident every time we played the Raiders. Their attitude was if they had a chance to take a cheap shot at me, they'd take it. And he's brought down at the 28-yard line. Here's a flag. And there's Ben Davis. Ben being a on by one of the Chiefs. Two more Chiefs come in. There's a big pile up. Davidson and Taylor are going at it. Here come all the Raiders. Holy Toledo. It's a free-for-all. The gamesmanship extended beyond the field of play. One time on Saturday, I was going by the visiting team locker room in Oakland, and there were some exterminators in there. And, and I said, well, you know, what's going on? He said, well, we got rats in this locker room. We're getting rid of them. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, take off. Leave the rats there. The rats are good. And if anyone says anything, I'll take responsibility. So now on Sunday, I, I go, and I knock on the chief's door, and I ask for Hank, and I said, Hank, I'll tell you, we got, and I say it loudly so the players can hear, but you know, it was, Hank, let me tell you, we have, we have a little problem in the locker room. We have rats in there. You got rats are in the locker room, but the next time, we're working on it, and the next time you come here, there won't be any more rats, but today you have to live with them. And uh, of course, you know, I, I, I talked to players about that, and. You know, they wouldn't put their feet in the ground. <laughs> they were, you know, standing up on the benches, getting dressed, and, and that was a crazy time. In the 69 playoffs, the Chiefs went to New York and beat Joe Namath and the defending champion Jets. Then it was Oakland home of the Rats and the rivals who had their number. There was a, a stretch there where the Kansas City Chiefs played the Oakland Raiders and lost seven out of eight games, which was bitter, bitter frustration. So we had to go out there to play them for the right to go to Super Bowl IV. They were so confident that they were going to win that the players had their bags packed for New Orleans because they were going to go right to the airport. In the last AFL championship ever played, the Chiefs finally got the best of the Raiders. He is throwing one deep for Warren Wells. It's intercepted by Emmett Cummins. Back to the 30, to the 40. He may break it. He's at midfield. He's at the 40. That will be the biggest play to date. It makes it so satisfying because as we're going to our bus to go catch a plane back to Kansas City to get ready to go to New Orleans, here come the Raider players with their suitcases in hand that had to walk by us to get to their cars. And I, I'll never forget that. That's the most enjoyable thing that I can recall. I came into the league in 1961. Uh, uh, a lot of our rookies can't remember playing in the polo grounds in front of 2,500 people or uh, Oakland out here in front of uh, as far as 3,000 people, and I've seen the league develop. Uh, there's a lot of pride and prestige and, and uh, uh, really a lot of love for the American Football League. Three, two, one. Both the space race and pro football were marvelously marketed for their times. There was so much that was going on socially that was freeing and unstructured and unorganized and do your own thing. And yet there was a compelling case for these two extremely interdependent, extremely collaborative exercises, one getting a man to the moon, the other one professional football, that struck the nation's imagination. That sense of Gene Kranz, the flight director, pacing around at uh, mission control, was, was soon mimicked on the field with head coaches with their heads set up to the booth, walking back and forth, trying to figure out what was going on. Look for 65 toss power trap. What does it look like? Hey, look for our 65 toss power trap. Let's see what it looks like. In a country that was rapidly hurtling forward, both pro football and the space mission were relentlessly modern. Apollo 11 was a mission born of the past, a promise kept to a fallen leader. Once it splashed down, Apollo 12 was on the clock. That mission belonged to the future, to the idea that it isn't enough to do something once. The AFL champion Chiefs were harbingers of another future, 
The history of their league was coming to an end, yet it would be defined by their performance in Super Bowl IV, the last game before the two leagues merged. After the Chiefs knock off the Raiders in the last AFL championship game, they head down to New Orleans and they're installed as 13-point underdogs. And George Blanda of the Raiders made a comment, they're doing it again. They're, they're taking the AFL for granted. They're not giving the AFL the respect it deserves. The Chiefs knew the sting of disrespect all too well. They had felt it ever since losing the first Super Bowl to Vince Lombardi and the NFL's Green Bay Packers. I think the Kansas City team is a real top football team. It doesn't compare with the National Football League team. That's what you want me to say, I said it. <laughs> That irritated us, and that, that, that stuck with us until we had another opportunity to get back to a Super Bowl. The fourth Super Bowl Sunday was filled with omens and symbols. Five years earlier, the AFL had pulled its all-star game out of a segregated New Orleans. Now the league was back in the form of the Chiefs, who had a chance to be the first world champions in pro football history, with more black starters than white. Honoring AFL history was none other than NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle. For a decade, the AFL was a league which belonged to its fans, and Rozelle adopted the idea of one of its biggest. 1969 was the 50th anniversary of the National Football League. Every team in the National Football League had a shoulder patch that said 50 NFL. Knowing that 1969 was the last year of the American Football League, I started writing letters to owners early, asking them to put an AFL patch on the AFL teams. At the end of the season came around, I received a letter from Jack Kemp uh, with a copy of a letter to Pete Rozelle, thanking Rozelle for seeing that a patch would be worn. So when I saw them come out with that patch, I was thrilled. The Vikings had their 50 NFL patch on and the, and the Chiefs had this 10 AFL patch on. We didn't know they were gonna do that. We were concerned about the Minnesota Vikings. Now we realize, hey, that's right, 10 years. We're in this thing and we're going to be representing the American Football League for the last time. In its fourth year, the Super Bowl was more and more a creature of the AFL. It was a spectacle. Specifically, it was a reenactment of the Battle of New Orleans, an American victory, at least the first time. The most ominous sign for the National Football League was that its part of the show never really got off the ground. I'd see this Viking going along, and he was jumping in and out of this hot air balloon. And then I understood that the hot air balloon was supposed to be going up. It was kind of a mass confusion on the field. The hot air balloon didn't have enough hot air in it, or lost its hot air or something. The Vikings' gondola started to bounce along in towards some of the seating at the part of the end zone. Maybe that was a, a coincidence that things were not going to go well for the Vikings that day. What the balloon lacked in hot air was more than made up for by Hank Stram. How in the world can all six of you miss a play like that? All six of you miss a play. Mr. Official, let me ask you something. Okay, coach, go ahead. How can six of you miss a play like that, huh? All six of you. The ball jumped out of there as soon as we made contact. I thought, I thought, I thought, you, were, I thought you were talking about you being on the field. No. What? Stram's Chiefs built a nine to nothing lead, and the manner in which they did it proved their offense was in another league. Even their shift out of the I formation caught the anxious Viking line offside. In Super Bowl IV, the Chiefs, with their offense of the 70s, all their multiple sets, all their man in motion, all their shifts, were doing things that, that frankly confused the Vikings. Yeah, Kosalki was running around there like it was a Chinese fire drill. They didn't know where Mike was. Oh, he didn't know where he was. They look like they're flat as hell. Gloucester, tell him 65 toss power trap. 
Get in there for 65 toss power trap. 65 toss power trap. That might pop wide open, Rats. Running play coming to Garrett on a trap. Touchdown. Garrett scores for the ball. We're leading now 16 to nothing, and they got to overcome that against our defense. No way. The Vikings did not put a single man in motion the entire game. They didn't have a single pre-snap shift in their offense the entire game. And they weren't even trying to disguise it. It was sort of a point of pride with them to let you know where they were going, and they thought they could succeed anyway. And so at halftime, Bud Grant just told the Vikings, go out and play better. Joe Cap, the big, strong quarterback, looked like he needed a trip to the emergency room after that game. Put your hand over your heart, and you can feel it pound out. What a moment for all of the Kansas City Chiefs. Watch a play-action pass, and make sure you keep them in that pocket. They're beating the best that the NFL has to offer out here today. That ball looked like it had helium in it. You can't float those balls in our league. That's right. Come on, Lenny. Pump it in there, baby. Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. Off the post sideline pattern. Taylor. Taylor, once a symbol of the two leagues' war over players, sealed the AFL's final victory. Just weeks after Apollo 12 proved man could go back to the moon, the Kansas City Chiefs planted an AFL flag atop the football world. We are so proud and we were 13 point underdogs. We won. We ended up the AFL with, with a great flourish. And I think those of us that have been around for nine or 10 years in the AFL and have been bad mouthed. Look down on, uh, take a special pleasure in this game. It's, it's unbelievable. Somebody said, uh, "Come on in here. You got to call him the president." I said, "President of what?" He said, "President of the United States." I said, "You're kidding me." And it was President Nixon. The AFL finally earns the respect it has so long desired. And the irony, of course, is it earns that respect at the moment it ceases to exist. Lamar Hunt spent a decade putting the league he founded before the franchise he owned. This was his reward. Could I get your reaction, uh, Lamar Hunt? As you look back to those other years, some 10 years ago, there must be quite a reaction. That was pretty fantastic. It's a beautiful trophy, and it really is a satisfying conclusion to the 10 years of the American Football League. And Lamar Hunt must have felt about as good as a team owner could feel after that game. To see him in the locker room at Old Tulane Stadium after Super Bowl IV is to see somebody who's whose dream has come true, and it's much better than even he could have dreamed of. We're very proud of the recognition that we established as champions of the world of professional football, and we sincerely think that you people here are the super fans of pro football. Thank you very much. The greatest day in the history of Kansas City. This team is the greatest in the universe. Good evening, everyone. From Gillette Stadium in Foxborough, this is Gil Santos along with Gino Capaletti. It's time for the National Football League season opener for the Patriots. 
50 years after the American Football League was founded. Both teams wearing throwback legacy uniforms. Gino, it's got to make you feel good to know that you wore that uniform for the first time in 1960 for the first game the Patriots ever played. And now 50 years later, here we all are. It just really does bring me back, and it's uh, an exciting thing for the National Football League to recognize exactly what the AFL meant to the success of professional football. After Super Bowl IV, the Chiefs returned to their locker room, members of a new NFL. Two weeks before the start of the 1970 season, the embodiment of the old NFL passed away. Lombardi, even though he was feared by a lot of AFL perennials, was also revered. They understood that Lombardi was a great coach. Lamar Hunt sent a note to Roselle suggesting that it would be a good idea to name the Super Bowl trophy in Lombardi's memory. The two rival leagues were embracing each other's past and forging a new future, shoulder to shoulder. Raise your right hand, repeat after me. I, I, Len Dawson, I, Joe Cap, have switched to Gillette Platinum Plus Blades. Have switched, switched to, to Gillette, Gillette Platinum Plus Blades. Because they shave closer and with more comfort. Well, I can only speak for Gillette Platinum Plus Injector Blades. That's true for double edge, too. Take my word for it. Why should I? Hey, come on, guys. This new NFL was about to become more of a pop culture powerhouse than either league was before. I'm right. I'm right. You're both right, right? Right. Pete Rozelle, Tex Schramm, Lamar Hunt, they had this missionary zeal about bringing the game to as many people as possible. And after the merger, one of the great themes of the next decade was Monday Night Football. in professional football meet for the first time ever as members of the new American Football Conference of the National Football League. We had an average of 60 million households watching primetime NFL football, which was unheard of. One of the teams playing in that first Monday night game was a classic AFL team with a gunslinger named Namath. Without the merger, I don't know whether or not the game would have been exciting enough to have been the instant hit it was. Lamar Hunt and his brave cohorts way back when deserve an enormous share of the credit for that. The door that they kicked open culminates with Monday Night Football and the enshrinement of uh, football as America's national game. We started, we hung in there, we merged, and now look at us. The appetite is so great that you can build a stadium for over a billion dollars and fill it and make money on it. Today, glittering structures of glass and steel are monuments to a war which left both leagues victors, a war which some continued to fight. I'll never forget in that perfect year I was doing the Dolphins locker room interviews. But we were underdogs. This was still how the AFL was regarded. We're unbeaten in the AFC. The Redskins have lost two or three games. We're playing them and they're favored. I drove with Jimmy Greek from Las Vegas to LA and I said, Jimmy missed set the line. I said, Jimmy, how could the Redskins be favored? We're unbeaten. He says, yeah, you're the AFL. You're still the AFL. I said, yeah, but we had Namath in. You're still the AFL. Redskins played tougher competition. I said, you're making a mistake. We dominated that game. For one-time members of the AFL, the road is the same as it was before the merger. Just win, baby. Al Davis remains a true believer. The Raiders won three Super Bowls in the late 70s and early 80s, and each championship ring is a tiny monument to the AFL. Davis's defiant message is as clear as the big A emblazoned on Raider rings. He might have it tattooed on his butt, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, he's an AFL guy, and it's important to him. What finger does he have that ring on? Does he have it on his middle finger? I don't know. Maybe that's his way of saying, you know, F you or something. <laughs> 
to, to the rest of the football world. You know, that was our tradition. We were the AFL. We can't forget our neighborhoods. We can't forget our high schools. And if you started in the AFL, you can't forget the AFL. In all my years as a head coach and in the Super Bowls with the Patriots, Lamar Hunt has always said to me, like either before the game or after we won, something along the lines of, you got to win this one for the AFL. This has got to be an AFL win. Or congratulations on the Super Bowl. You know I was pulling for you. AFL. Lamar Hunt passed away in 2006. But his dream lives on in the players, coaches, and fans of the American Football League and all who've since followed. Without a doubt, you know, it was a huge season. Come on, 58, get on that tight end. Damn, go get him! He's more famous for the Bears as being a defensive coordinator, and they were about 18 and one, and had probably the best defense in the history of the game, yet he still wears that jet ring. To this day, that's the only ring he wears. If it weren't for the AFL, you don't know what would have happened to you. I mean, what, what, what opportunities would I have had to coach? Every time I saw Lamar Hunt, I thanked him. Lamar, you know, he got it going, and I got all the guys behind it. Somewhere down the line, I'd been able to write or say hello to each one of them and say thank you. In a time of change, the AFL embraced a new way of doing things rooted in the oldest of American values. It gave players and dreamers a fighting chance at a life in pro football. Black and white didn't matter nearly as much as ability and commitment. AFL football became more than a game. In a decade when we were sometimes at our worst, we looked at the American Football League and saw ourselves, our best selves. The 60s, there'll never be a decade like the 60s. Never in any area of our life. War, space, assassinations, and the AFL was there. Unbelievable.